The NFL is one of the most popular sport leagues in the United States. They have produced top-tier athletes, actors, politicians, and serial killers. Here are two football players turned serial killers. Randall Woodfield had dreams of making it big in the NFL. After he was let go by the Green Bay Packers in 1974, his life spiraled into the life of a serial killer. Woodfield was born on December 26, 1950 in Salem, Oregon, and was the third child of a wealthy family. In middle school, he started showing signs of inappropriate sexual behavior and began exposing himself to girls. And in high school, he was known around town as a peeping Tom. His parents were so concerned by his behavior that they put him in therapy. Despite his behavior problems, he excelled in football, basketball, and track throughout high school. He attended Treasure Valley Community College and his unusual habits escalated to violence when he ransacked his ex-girlfriend's apartment. He then transferred to Portland University where he played football. His football skills got the attention of the NFL and he was drafted by the Packers in 1974. But he didn't last long because he was kicked off the team a few months later due to over a dozen indecent exposure arrests. Unable to maintain his football career, Woodfield left Wisconsin and returned to Portland, Oregon. It was there that his first crime spree would begin. In 1975, 24-year-old Randall Woodfield began robbing women by knife point and forcing them to perform oral sex before stealing their purses. In order to catch him, the local police had female officers act as decoys and he was caught on March 3rd of that year. He received a 10-year sentence for second-degree robbery and only served four of the 10-year sentence. A few months after his release from prison in 1979, he began his second crime spree and this time it became deadly. While some people are rehabilitated or scared straight after serving time in prison, Woodfield doubled down. When he was released in July 1979, he reconnected with Sherry Ayers, a 29-year-old former classmate. The pair had known each other since the second grade, and he wrote to her while he was in prison. Sometime after his release, he bumped into her and they discussed their high school's 10-year class reunion. We don't know exactly what happened, but we do know that he showed up at her apartment on October 9, 1980. Sherry was raped and murdered. He hit her on the head with an unknown object, then stabbed her in the neck repeatedly. Woodfield was a suspect immediately and was questioned by the police, but there wasn't any evidence that was directly tied to Woodfield and he refused a polygraph test. The only clue that the police had to go by was a car that looked like Woodfield's was spotted leaving the scene of the crime. As a result, he wasn't arrested. A short month later, Woodfield's urge to kill returned and his next target was 22-year-old Darcy Fix. And just like Sherry, Darcy wasn't a stranger. She was the ex-girlfriend of Woodfield's college friend, and he decided to attack her on Thanksgiving Day. What he didn't expect was 24-year-old Keith Altick to show up in the middle of the attack. He bound and gagged both Darcy and Keith and shot them execution-style inside of her home. Woodfield was questioned because of his connection with the victim, and once again, there were no charges due to lack of evidence. Woodfield didn't just kill people he knew. He changed his tactics and started killing strangers. On December 9, 1980, he began wearing a fake beard and a nasal strip and started a series of robberies in Oregon. He committed armed robberies on gas stations, restaurants, and even an ice cream parlor. In some of the robberies, he would force female workers to either expose themselves or to pleasure him. By January 1981, the police were calling him the I-5 Bandit because of his predilection to commit his crimes at businesses near the highway. No one was safe from this one-man crime wave. On January 14th, he broke into the home with two sisters, ages 10 and 8. He made them disrobe and forced them to perform acts on him. A few days later, he broke into an office building and murdered Shari Hull and injured Beth Wilmot after sexually assaulting them. His reign of terror didn't stop in Oregon. By February, he was in California, often committing multiple crimes on the same day. On February 3rd, 1981, 37-year-old Donna Eckert and her 14-year-old daughter Janelle were found dead in their home in Mountain Gate, California, just off the I-5. The mother and daughter were found in the master bedroom in bed and shot multiple times in the head. Lab tests revealed that Janelle was sexually assaulted. The next day, 
Woodfield kidnapped, sexually assaulted, and robbed three women from three separate businesses. On February 9th, he robbed two more businesses, as well as sexually assaulted women at both locations. His last murder occurred on February 15th, when he was 30 years old. He was back in Oregon, and once again, he went after someone he knew. He shot and killed his ex-girlfriend, 18-year-old Julie Ritz, inside of her home in Beaverton, Oregon. With the revelation that another woman that Woodfield knew was murdered, the police immediately made him the prime suspect. Although he was a suspect for the murder of Julie Ritz, the police didn't have him under surveillance, and he was able to commit three more robberies and a sexual assault before he was finally taken in for questioning. After his March 3rd interrogation for Julie's murder, his apartment was searched and he was put in a lineup and was chosen as the culprit time and time again by the women he attacked. One of the witnesses included Beth Wilmot, who survived being shot in the head. But as the investigation into Woodfield continued, Beaverton, Oregon police began to see a pattern. The crimes all occurred along the I-5 highway. The police then decided to check the phone records of payphones along the I-5. Police Chief David Bishop said, Woodfield was addicted to the phone. He made thousands of calls. He had girlfriends everywhere. The phone records convinced the police that Woodfield was the suspect for a five-month crime spree that took the lives of 18 people. Despite being directly linked to 18 murders, he was only charged for the murder of Shari Hull. During the trial, the district attorney for the county said that Woodfield was the coldest, most detached defendant I've ever seen. He was ultimately found guilty of Shari Hull's murder, the attempted murder of Beth Wilmot, and two counts of sodomy and received life in prison. Another 35 years were added to his sentence later that year when he was convicted of sodomy and weapons charges for his attack on another woman in a restaurant bathroom. By 1990, it was believed that Woodfield actually killed upwards of 44 people, but because the state of Oregon was unable to afford multiple trials, they were satisfied with Woodfield's life sentence. As of the making of this video, Randall Woodfield is 71 years old and is currently serving his sentence at the Oregon State Penitentiary. Oakland Raiders player Anthony Wayne Smith had it all. Money, talent, fame, and was once married to Prince's protege, Vanity. But as his star dwindled, he started a life of crime that would end with four dead and a firebombing. Born in Elizabeth City, North Carolina, Anthony Smith was known as a charismatic and extremely athletic student. He played for the Raiders for six years, and during that time, he married singer Vanity, but their marriage only lasted a year. And according to Vanity, Smith was physically abusive. He cultivated an image of someone that wanted to help the community. You can't change the world, but you can change the life of one kid. Become a mentor at the Los Angeles City Housing Project. But after his successful time with the Raiders and a year with the Broncos, he abruptly retired at 31 years old and began his life of crime. For reasons unknown, Smith began hanging out with gang members and started illegal side businesses. In 1999, his first business was an online medical billing company that ended up being investigated by the FTC. But his billing scams soon devolved into murder. Ricky and Kevin Nettles were successful businessmen. The brothers owned an auto repair shop, a barber shop, and a cell phone and beeper store. On November 10, 1999, Kevin was with a friend watching the Lakers game in his auto shop. Suddenly, a tall man wearing a green police jacket and a badge walked into the office with his gun drawn. The man would be later identified as Anthony Smith. He ordered Kevin to step outside just as his brother Ricky was closing their barber shop across the street. Ricky and an employee ran to see what was going on and another man in a dark suit and badge walked up to Ricky and said that the brothers were being taken in for questioning. The pair were forced into the back of a car, and that was the last time anyone would see them alive. The next day, Ricky's body was found on a street in Compton, California, and Kevin's body was found eight miles away. Both men were tortured by being burned multiple times with U-shaped and triangle-shaped brands were on their torsos and faces. Their heads were wrapped in duct tape and they were stabbed repeatedly. When the police went to investigate, they found that Ricky's apartment was ransacked. For years, the Nettles murders went unsolved and Anthony Smith felt untouchable. But one of the things he hated the most was when he felt like people were taking advantage of him or owed him money. 
In March 2003, the consignment furniture store Simply Sofa was firebombed. When detectives spoke to the owner, Marilyn Nelson, she revealed that she had an argument with Smith two weeks before. The dispute started when Smith had Simply Sofa to sell his furniture. When he returned to collect his check and unsold furniture, he claimed that his items were damaged. Marilyn told him that the items arrived that way, but Smith got angry and demanded that he be compensated for the damage, and the pair began to argue. Anthony Smith was 6 foot 3 and over 300 pounds, and Marilyn decided this wasn't a fight she was willing to continue. So, she wrote him a check for $615 for the damaged furniture. The next day, he came back claiming that he lost the check and demanded that she write him another one. Not wanting to get into another confrontation, she did. But when the bank called about a second check being cashed for the same amount by Anthony Smith, her daughter told the bank not to cash the check. Two weeks later, Simply Sofa was torched. Anthony Smith was suspected immediately, and the police even found remnants of paperwork with Smith and his wife's name on it, wrapped around what was left of the firebomb. But even though he was arrested and charged for arson, there wasn't enough evidence to convict him. During the trial, he was charismatic and by all accounts was a great witness. His supporters included members of his church who were convinced that he did nothing wrong, and gang members wearing raider jackets at his trial. The trial deadlocked and Smith was free. Smith had evaded prison, but he wasn't done yet. On October 7, 2008, 30-year-old Marilio Ponce was found dead on a deserted road and there were signs of torture. He had a black eye and dozens of shallow cuts and large bruises along his back. Marilio was made to kneel and killed execution style. He was shot twice in the back of the head and eight times in the torso. The police knew that Anthony Smith, along with two other men, were somehow involved because of the multiple calls that were made to and from Smith the night that Marilio disappeared. They also tracked Smith's cell phone and it was proven that he was in the area where Marilio was found. When the police searched Smith's condo, they found Marilio's car and another stolen car in Smith's allotted spots. They also found rubber gloves, rope that had been cut, police-style zip ties, a pellet gun, and a book called Make Em Pay, Ultimate Revenge Techniques from the Master Trickster in the trunk of the second car. Smith also had several baseball caps with the words Bell Enforcement and Fugitive Recovery Agent. When asked why he had Marilio's car and the keys, he claimed that Marilio told him that he was late on his car payment and wanted it chopped up so he could claim that it was stolen to his insurance company. Smith also claimed that he and Marilio dealt in stolen freight. This time, his claims of innocence didn't work. In March 2011, Anthony Smith was put on trial for the murder of Marilio Ponce. By the time it came to deliberation in April, the jury was deadlocked, but they favored the guilty verdict. But while Smith waited for a retrial, he became connected to the Nettles brothers' murders because he was a suspect in another murder. In 2001, Dennis Henderson was found dead in the back of his car. He had been stomped to death. His cheekbone was fractured, he had a dislocated jaw, and he had been stabbed in his left eye, his ear, and 11 times in the back. Dennis's brother Barry told the police that Anthony had to be his brother's murderer due to the pair having a falling out about money. During the investigation, Barry told the police something interesting. At one point, the Henderson brothers were friends with Anthony Smith, and Smith once bragged about how he kidnapped and killed two brothers. Police looked into the claim and learned about the Nettles brothers' murder case. With enough evidence connecting him to the additional murders, he was charged with three more counts of murder in July 2011. On November 5, 2015, he was convicted of the murders of the Nettle brothers and Dennis Henderson. On January 22, 2016, Smith was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. As of the making of this video, Anthony Smith is 54 years old and is currently serving his sentence in a California prison. Thank you for watching The Twin Files. Don't forget to like and subscribe. So what do you think about these murders? Let us know in the comments.